The first glimpse of Socotra, magical island of fairy tales and fantasy. The barren coast where Sinbad the sailor was shipwrecked. Socotra has some of the world's strangest plants. But it is so remote and little known that there are plants and animals here that have never been described by scientists. What makes the place so interesting is the extreme climate. The dry season can last for nine months when a hot, dry wind blows. By the end of it, most ordinary plants would be dead. So the local flora consists of species that have evolved special defenses. All the strange plants of Socotra have got built-in drought resistance, genetically determined, potentially of great interest to plant breeders. Botanists are still collecting material to write the first flora of the island. Uh, above, above your head. head. Above your head. That's that one, that's it. Yeah? yeah. Great, right, yeah. It's good. What is it? It's well, a, it's a leguminous vine, but... We haven't seen it before, so it's uh, a new record, at least. Not sure what it is. This is a uh, number we collected two years ago. Um, and I've tried to name it at Edinburgh and couldn't get a name on it. So it seems to be a new species and possibly even a new genus because it, it's quite distinct. But we didn't have flowers before, we just had fruits. So this is the first time we've seen it flowering. It's mm. Oh, we've got a seedling as well. That's good. There we go. The object is to, to collect dried, pressed flattened herbarium specimens, these we can take back to our institute and use as duplicates, so we'll leave some with the Yemeni authorities here. We can send some to other botanical institutes for, for verification to experts. And these, these stand as a permanent record of the vegetation. The Socotran begonia was collected in the 1880s and cross-bred to produce the European garden begonia. If there's a new disease of begonias, this is where resistance could be found. The strange cucumber tree has genes which could change cultivation of the vegetable dramatically. Who knows, in the future, perhaps edible cucumbers could be grown on trees like this. People have lived on the island for hundreds of years and know every detail of the local flora. They make use of more than half the plants that are found on the island, many of them unique to Socotra. These umbrella-shaped trees are actually the source of the island's most famous product, the so-called dragon's blood. Exported from Socotra for centuries, it was always a mysterious product. Few people knew where it came from, and it certainly looks as if it could be the congealed blood of a monster. It is still used as a ceramic dye and for medicine and magic. The islander's use of plants is characterized by moderation. Only a few are harvested at any one time. Houses are built with beams of the Sisyphus tree, but trees can't be cut down without good reason, as one of the elders explains. Oh no, we don't allow it. We don't allow it at all. No, never. Especially Zarad, Emiro, Akshay, and the other trees that are vital to our animals. We wouldn't let anyone touch those. And Imta, the drought tree for goats, no one is ever allowed to cut that down. 
وانت جرعه خاصة جرعه انت خاصة حتيش This man got into trouble with his neighbors for cutting a live tree. It was only when he explained that his house had been destroyed in a flood that his emergency tree felling activity was accepted. Among the species that the islanders have conserved is the only wild relative of the pomegranate, Punica protopunica. As these fruits show, there is considerable genetic diversity, but with pomegranates being the best known natural source of vitamin C, the commercial interest in this species could be considerable. This raises one of the stickiest questions currently being discussed internationally. How can the country of origin of potentially valuable genetic material ensure that it gets a fair share of any profits from commercialization? If Socotra's unique genetic resources are taken from the island and used, how should the benefits be shared? The Convention on Biological Diversity confirmed that countries own the genetic resources found within their borders. Countries are responsible for conserving their genetic resources and for using them wisely. But the potential value is so great for improving crops or to produce a new medicine, for example, that commercial interests have become more and more interested, leading to some serious areas of conflict. The Americans in the last couple of decades have been the ones who've been the most aggressive at pursuing intellectual property rights and taking them to extremes which none of us would have even thought of 20 years ago. But uh, certainly the solution to me is not that we, we take what is the common heritage of all humanity and turn it into the, the, the private preserve of a few corporations. And that is what, what's, what is being pushed for in, in the current intellectual property rights activities. Protection for inventors has traditionally been provided by patent legislation. And in America since 1931, patents have been applied both to plant varieties and to plant extracts such as medicines. A patent is a form of intellectual property which gives its owner the right to exclude others from making, using or selling the invention that's covered by the claims for a period of 20 years from the date of filing. And what it needs to do is be new, useful, unobvious and enabled by the specification. To be eligible for a patent, the applicant must be the breeder of the new variety. The variety must be new and clearly distinguishable from any other variety whose existence is already known. Despite these requirements, some surprising patents have been granted. The Indian neem tree has been used by Indians for thousands of years as a pesticide and its antibacterial properties have made it useful for healing wounds. Millions of Indians also use neem sticks as toothbrushes. Yet in America, over a hundred patents have been granted on the active ingredients of neem, as well as for various methods of extraction. For some people, this is taking patents a step too far. The way I look at it, of course, is that it's straightforward theft. That if in modern science we recognize there's something like principles, and within those principles there are narrow applications, and if you've innovated a principle, then any tinkering in within that is an obvious application. Mm. So that once you have the basic um, idea that neem is a good pest control agent, then you basically have a principle that you might you know, make a five month shelf life chemical out of it, you might make a dust powder out of it, or you might make uh, oil extract out of it. That doesn't change the fact that the knowledge that neem pro produces pesticide action, that that knowledge is the first innovation and everything else following is obvious. Well, if it was a natural product, it wouldn't be patentable because it wouldn't fall into the statutory category of invention. If you took a product that you discovered in the rainforest, brought it back to your laboratory, did some changes to it, purified it, made some yeah. extracts, 
and you went through the process of finding out what the utility for that product was, you made the changes, then in fact you would probably be, that would be patentable subject matter. Again, the duty of disclosure of the applicant is to let us know all the information associated with how he came about that discovery, if there are references available. The problem is that knowledge about traditional medicines or the breeding work of ordinary peasant farmers is rarely written down, never mind published. Takabai, a Gujarat peanut farmer, has recently developed his own variety of peanut by carefully selecting from a single parent plant. He finds it more resistant to disease and gives a better yield than other local varieties. He sells or barters the seed of his own varieties to anyone who asks. Exchanging seed freely is a farmer's tradition. In three years it spread to 50 villages. It's our custom to discover new varieties. Peanuts have only been grown round here for a few years, but my Morello is already very popular. At present, no one is making a financial gain from this variety. Takavai certainly isn't, but the trend internationally is for such seeds to be registered, even patented, by commercial interests. Even when farmers may have selected or bred local varieties for generations. The basis of intellectual property is that seed companies have done breeding, they need to be compensated for it, they need rights. Our argument is that farmers have also done breeding and in fact what the seed corporations use are farmers' varieties. And therefore, if you have to recognize the contribution to breeding of the seed industry, you also have to recognize the contribution to breeding of farmers. Farmers' rights are basically the recognition of farmers as breeders. And in our view, all other rights are derivative rights because all other seeds are derivative seeds from farmers' varieties. But the idea that farmers' seed varieties may become the private property of seed companies has stirred a dramatic response. Activists have coined the term biopiracy. <laughs> At Bangalore in 1993, a hundred thousand farmers gathered to pledge support for their seeds and the traditions associated with them. It's the powerful stealing from the weaker parties of the world. Um, and I know it's a very uneven game, but uh, it's one of the issues that is so outrageous to me, that if it takes me the rest of my life, to keep screaming biopiracy is taking place, for each time it is done, I will say it. The rights of farmers arising from their past, present and future contribution to plant genetic resources has now been accepted internationally. Just how those rights should be recognized has become a major international issue. At the Leipzig conference on plant genetic resources in 1996, delegates were left in no doubt about the urgency of the issue. One country that has taken a lead in approaching this issue is India. We want to have a balance between the incentive to the researcher and at the same time the farmer researcher who could be viewed equally uh, as a strong partner in the total development of agriculture in the country. If given the responsibility together, they can conserve it and further improve it. And they are the one who should have a very good right in the total process. So I think that for medicinal crops, high value crops and commodities, which really exist in those remote areas, should be really linked with the community rights as far as possible. So that they get the returns out of it and they get the encouragement for protecting it for years to come. But many campaigners who work with rural communities 
find the way that these issues are being debated internationally leaves a great deal to be desired. It's really very heavily driven by commercial interests. And in fact, if you go to the, in, in many of the meetings of the conference of parties of the Biodiversity Convention, for instance, you will see all the biggest agribusiness corporations or pharmaceutical por corporations there in the, in the meeting itself, lobbying all these government delegates. And even before that, they already have lots of uh, lobbyists who have been working on the governments. Then you will see that it's their interest that is always being pushed forward. There's still a very big gap because indigenous peoples who are a significant uh, uh, stakeholder in this whole issue are not really have not uh, participated very very actively in the whole process growing commercial interests in the use of biodiversity has led to some interesting and controversial arrangements costa rica is thought to have over four percent of the world's terrestrial biodiversity it's also a major center for the study of tropical ecosystems. InBio is staffed by local scientists and has close links with several respected universities and botanic gardens around the world. We formally established InBio in 1989. Uh, it was actually the result of a very interesting process that we decided to conduct, making a critical examination of what, as a country, we were doing in terms of conservation. That analysis led to the conclusion that the best way we have to save our biodiversity into perpetuity, and perhaps the only way, is to put this biodiversity to work for society. But biodiversity has to be known and valued by Costa Rican society. Uh, something that very, very important has happened here in Costa Rica, which was the, the in a way, the collapse, of, uh, the collapse of, of the cattle industry, the loss or the drop in, in coffee and banana prices. And the realization, uh, that was something that we had been preaching, I mean we, I mean the people who have been interested in conservation of biodiversity, that nature in Costa Rica provided a fantastic opportunity for the development. And so the so-called ecotourism started booming. And now ecotourism, nature-oriented tourism, represents number one source of income for the country, above bananas, coffee, cattle, and, and other types of, of industries. I mean, that touches the pocket of people. As ecotourism became established, a number of entrepreneurs started marketing rainforest products, such as herbs and spices. Regulations were drawn up to ensure that the extraction of these products is managed sustainably. And, and nowadays, I mean, it is extremely satisfactory for us to just look at the economic section in, in, in the papers, in the newspapers, and see that the price of land is higher if it has forests and it's close to a national park as opposed to what used to be 10 years ago, that the price of land was higher it was, even if it was a pasture land, it was some type of uh, cultivated area. Now we are talking about a quarter of the country, 25% of the country, devoted to absolute protection of biodiversity in pretty much its wild stage. In a quarter of the country, that's national parks, that's the reserves of different kinds of management, in private reserves. This is very interesting. I mean, we have an incredible number of them. We have now over 100 private reserves in the country. So it's a mixture of governmental, private, uh, NGOs, uh, kind of thing. OK, a quarter of the country. But the point for us is now we have to know what we have there. 
and we have to put this knowledge to work for the benefit of society because the, we humans value what we know. We need to promote this perception of, of, of values there and for that we need education. Now they have an opportunity to learn about that fantastic library if you want to because we use also the analogy of the forest as a library and what we need to do is first is to catalog the library in order to use the library to make the library accessible to children and to scientists and politicians and engineers and whatever so you know that the library is important not because of the number of volumes or because of its size it's because of who is using the library and how is the use of that library of some benefit for society from the outset, INBIO, with government approval, looked for opportunities to develop academic or commercial partnerships to help finance and staff their research and training programs. The first agreement was with the giant American pharmaceutical company, Merck. This deal is a, a part of our larger scheme of uh, examining the natural uh, world for potential new products. Uh, we look at this as a source of chemical diversity. Uh, now, in considering chemical diversity, you, you, one would have to look at what man has made, the, the, the thousands and thousands of synthetic chemicals, versus what Mother Nature has made over the, over the eons. Mother Nature is an extraordinarily versatile chemist. And the diversity that she has been able to make over the, over the years, over the centuries, is certainly vastly more than what man has thought of so far. So in terms of finding new drugs, it's important to look at as wide a variety of compounds as one physically can. To do that in a, in a short term, we look at both synthetic chemicals and natural products. In this context, NBO is, is one source of natural products for examination. Clearly a company like Merck is going to be spending hundreds of millions of dollars to bring any of these products to the market eventually. Uh, this is a very great expense and it's something that I think our shareholders have a right to expect a return on. At the beginning when, when we started this agreement <clears throat> the capacity here in Costa Rica was very limited. There was not equipment to, to do the initial steps in the process of searching for new, for new products. There was really nothing to, 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 to look into that. So <clears throat> in the first agreement with Merck, a considerable portion of equipment was transferred, transferred to Costa Rica. And at the same time, capacity building was done with local people or local scientists working with Merck personnel here and in the U.S. to upgrade their, their capacity. In the search for new products, a group of Costa Rican graduates have been recruited to be what are called bioprospectors. The bioprospector bio is trained to look for biological leads, not really ethnobot ethnobotany leads, but biological leads. Uh, where is that insect feeding? Why is avoiding that particular plant? Why that particular plant causes an irritation when you touch it, and so on and so forth. I mean, a lot of uh, biological leads that suggest that potential useful products or potential useful molecules could be there. Merck has permission to develop any new product from a specified number of samples they take out in any one year. In the eventuality that we find something that does pan out, not necessarily even a compound that itself will be a drug, but a compound that leads to the eventual discovery of a drug, both in bio and the Costa Rican government receive royalty payments on that. This will encourage not only our direct collaborator, but the Costa Rican government to expand their efforts in conservation. And we think that this is probably the most valuable aspect of the whole deal. INVIO is a, a non-governmental agency. It's a private, non-profit, public interest. We don't have any subsidy from the government. And yet, by let's say NGO standards, we have been successful. And I think we, we have been successful because of, I think, what's been in my, my words, the, the link between conservation and human development. 
In bio is certainly one of the most advanced biodiversity research centers in the developing world. It has agreements with several other pharmaceutical companies and with academic institutions to provide specimens and samples on a commercial basis. The Biodiversity Convention requires that benefits from the use of genetic resources should be shared with the country of origin. These agreements may be one way of meeting this requirement for possible new drugs, but the situation is often rather different for agricultural crops. It's actually a lot more complicated. If you're, if you're dealing with a medicinal plant, you can very often locate uh, exactly where that species comes from. Maybe it's in the middle of the rainforest of the Amazon. And you know, you know what the country of origin is. Uh, that's, the, that's the term that's used in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a legally binding convention. But when you get to agriculture, it's a whole different ballgame. And the reason is that agricultural crops have, have been evolving uh, with the hands of under the hands of people, the influence of people for many thousands of years, and they've been spreading all over the world. So when you look at the legal definition of what country of origin in is, it's not what you and I might, might think it is. Uh, country of origin legally uh, is defined as where the plant material is found in in situ conditions, in other words, growing in its natural habitat. And for uh, domesticated and cultivated crops, they defined that term in C2 conditions is meaning where the distinctive property first arose. So it's not where you might have collected the plant. Uh, you, you might know where you collected the plant. I would call that the source country. But uh, country of origin is where the distinctive properties in that plant first arose. And we don't really have a pedigree or an ancestry that would date back thousands of years in many cases to tell us where you know, the particular characteristic disease resistance or cooking quality of a particular food where it really came from. One case in point is wheat, a crop with a particularly complicated ancestry. The first Durham wheats are thought to have occurred when two species of grass hybridized nine or ten thousand years ago. The Durham wheat evolved by accidental outgrassing and it got fertile by fertility restoration on its own. That was the emmer wheat or the durum wheat, the ones which ends up making noodles and spaghettis, etc. Then another outcross happened in nature several thousand BCs ago, and that gave us what is now called the bread wheat of commerce. So there are three grass species involved in this process of wheat as it is grown today, the commercial bread wheat. This third contributing wild species is called Triticum tauchii. Simplistically, it's known as goat grass. It's got other names like Agilopsis corosa or Agilops tauchii. Our program in Simit, on one phase, has accumulated about 500 accessions of these Agilopsis corosa from Turkey all the way into China. Scientists here have recently made technical breakthroughs that allow them to crossbreed these wild grasses with existing durum weeds. The result is the production of what they call synthetic hexaploid weeds, incorporating all the genetic diversity of the goat grass, features like drought tolerance and heat resistance. We are now doing this process of evolution once again reinventing the wheel, as you may call it. So we've taken the best Durham varieties, which our Durham program has got, the breeding program. We keep touch with them. And we are crossing all the 500 accessions of this goat grass onto these Durham, so we should technically end up with 500 synthetic hexaploids. Each row represents one synthetic hexaploid. And there are close to uh, the 480 or 500 of these combinations produced at this stage. This is an extremely good example of conserving genetic diversity in a form which could be used for many decades from here on out. In essence then what we have to say is one synthetic hexaploids represents 
conservation of genetic diversity of the goat grass in a usable form for plant breeders around the world in the public or private domain. It does not matter to us. Well, it's, it's going to be very difficult to do if we try to track every uh, genetic contribution to an agricultural variety, for example. Uh, typically, you know, a breeding program uh, can involve hundreds, maybe even thousands of crosses before you get to the final product. Uh, in many cases, you'll be using materials that uh, maybe 50 different farmer varieties coming from 25 different countries um, and thousands of crosses. So what's the final genetic contribution and what's the monetary value of each one of those genetic contributions from each one of those varieties that's used? It's just going to be impossible. There, we have no quantitative way of figuring out where the genes came from that ended up in the final variety. And we have no qualitative way of assigning a particular value to one gene or set of genes uh, over another. Although calculating the benefits in monetary terms may be very difficult for crop plants, there are other potential benefits associated with the use of plant genetic resources. The first aspect of benefit sharing really is the, and the capacity of the countries that provide genetic resources to make use of those resources themselves. That's really the, what I would consider as the first most important benefit. And that's derived essentially uh, through building capacity, through education, through training. And therefore, companies or corporations that invest in training the recipients uh, of technology, in fact, those companies will be contributing significantly towards capacity building and benefit sharing. And from what I understand, the IMBIO model has in fact put a considerable emphasis on training and capacity building. But unless we halt or control genetic erosion, there will be few benefits to share at all. Increasing population and inappropriate land use are causing the degradation of many ecosystems. New methods of management will have to be found if present trends are to be halted. In Central America, much forest land has been cleared to create pasture, a poor land management option and an unsustainable one. Near the ancient ruins of Tikal, a project called Olafo aims to develop an alternative approach by showing villagers new ways to use plant resources in the forest while still conserving its biodiversity. At this camp within the Mayan Biosphere Reserve, 20 local campesinos are learning a completely new set of skills and being paid a weekly wage. These forests had all the mahogany taken out 20 years ago, so the Olafo project aims to find new forest species for extraction and use. Several new timber species are being developed, like this Santa Maria. Part of the work is estimating a sustainable harvesting regime. Other species, like Chate, could be developed for horticulture once markets can be found. The point is that in order to be able to use these species in a sustainable manner, we should first be sure we know exactly how they grow, how many there are, so that we avoid what has happened with other species. For example, traditional timber varieties or other non-timber species. Because many people talk about biodiversity and few people really understand what it is. What we need to do is to define what impact different species in the forest have on each other. For example, what impact the exploitation of timber resources has on other species. This is fundamental if we are to make the optimum use of our forests.
Well, we've learned a lot, because we didn't even know what it meant to have a forest management project, or what the Mayan biosphere reserve was. I mean, we'd heard about the reserve, but we didn't know exactly what it meant, and the advantages of working in the forest like this, to make better use of the land and to keep the forest. They are now assessing a wide variety of forest plants to find out their potential. But as with the international efforts at conserving genetic resources in gene banks or in situ, funding for the extensive research that is needed is hard to come by. I sometimes worry that we might need another disaster before people will wake up. Um, we, we need a, a corn blight in the U.S., for example, or you know, a potato blight in Ireland. We need something that really is going to make people pay attention to what happens when you don't make appropriate investments into conserving the resource base and supporting the kind of research that enables you to adapt to change. I think that one of the other factors that we see around the world is very rapid change in economics, in politics, in ecosystems, in climate. And we're adapting well so far. We have to be pretty honest about this. We're, we're all doing well. We're comfortable. We're well fed. We're getting fatter. We have more heart disease because we're eating so much rich food and so forth. But this is a, a very ephemeral kind of game if it is not built on a capacity to adapt to the future changes. The changes are going to continue, and they may even accelerate. So we have to be able to maintain our research investment to be able to adapt to change and maintain the biodiversity in nature and in agroecosystems to have the raw material to adapt to those changes. What we are dealing with here is changing human behavior. And there are two ways of doing that. One is education and the other is public awareness. And until we start to invest quite strongly in education and public awareness, we will not succeed in everything that we are doing. I think what we saw in, at Earth Summit, the up to the Earth Summit, natural resources divided the world between the North and the South. I think what's emerging under the Convention of Biological Diversity, considering all the processes that are going on, genetic resources have become a tool for uniting and bringing together nations to find common solutions. Because of hunger and poverty, genetic resources are incredibly important. What we're talking about with genetic resources is uh, forty percent of the world's economy is about ninety percent or ninety-five percent of the survival requirements of poor people around the world. Genetic resources are the basis of their survival for their, for their clothing, for their food, for their medicines, for their fuel, for everything. Uh, so it's absolutely critical for, for the poor. It's absolutely vital to their food security. It is for the rest of the world as well. I mean, industry has a really mechanistic view of all of this, and I've seen it described since the Rio Earth Summit many times, that basically we have climate change. And climate change is the real problem. But because the climate is going to change or is changing around us, uh, we need to be able to adapt crops and, uh, to the, that new, those new climatic conditions to be able to both meet new opportunities and defend ourselves against both new, new climate and new pests created by those climates. And genetic resources are the tool or the raw materials you need to have in industry to adjust to climate change. I'm, I'm still optimistic in spite of this whole scenario because I've seen how local communities are really, are really very determined to conserve this kind of biodiversity. And I think that's where the whole hope lies, really. It's not in all these international negotiations. It's really in, in strengthening the capacity of the communities, the indigenous peoples, to continue nurturing and sustaining this uh, biodiversity. And no matter what kind of agreements come out internationally or whether in the national level, for as long as this biodiversity is kept under the control of these peoples, of these communities, I think we really will have a hope that the, that kind of biodiversity is going to be conserved. Some of these communities have genetic resources which till now have been unfamiliar to the rest of the world. The development of new food crops will continue to be an important aspect of the use of plant genetic resources. The world has gained few major new crops in the last hundred years, but who knows, quinoa, oka and uluka may be household names the world over in the next millennium. We may even have some new types of potato. We need to work with national programs, 
we need to, and, and national programs is a, in, a, in a broad sense, that's all of the different institutions and actors who have something to bring to, the, uh, to, to this at the national level to develop e effective ways in which they can be working together. That requires the right policies, the right strategies, the right institutions and the right people. Training is going to be fundamental to that. We need to continue research into those outstanding areas where we still need to, uh, we can still be more effective. We need to continue to build national and international documentation and information systems so that will underpin the whole of this work. In situ conservation has to be global because every country in one way or the other has to offer something to this global initiative of in situ conservation. Uh, country like India with a mega biodiversity center obviously has much more to contribute but even smaller nations uh, would have in their own way to participate in this total global initiative in a partnership mode. So that perspective, the total perspective of conservation has to be kept in mind. Right from the childhood, every child should be able to understand what is his responsibility towards the biological diversity. Obviously they are the caretaker of tomorrow and this is all beginning. The real effect of present initiatives will only become evident in the decades to come. Imbuing the next generation with the true knowledge of the value of biodiversity could make all the difference. One such initiative has been developed by Anil Gupta and his team from the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. This is the biodiversity competition at Lok Niketan, a large rural primary school in the north of Gujarat state. The pupils have been given a week to find out as much as they can about local plant varieties from crops to medicines. There are prizes for the best collections and the most knowledgeable children. There's also a prize for the best recipe using a wild plant as a vegetable. We have come across this time a child who has documented 250 plants, 260 list, list of 260 plants at the age of about uh, 10 years, 11 years. This is unprecedented. Yeah. See, the point is that they have also been talking to their parents, grandparents, and you know that is one purpose. How to telescope the knowledge transfer. So in the last three days, the amount of knowledge which has been transferred to the grandchildren generation would not have happened in 20 years, 30 years. Because they, it is a concentrated approach. Everybody went to all their uncles, aunts, grand aunts, grand uncles and tried to find out from them how much they knew. So I think this is one advantage of the biodiversity competition that it capsules, it telescopes the process of learning, the transfer of knowledge, which in its normal course may not get transferred even in 20 years, 30 years, gets transferred within say about uh, three days, two days. And uh, the challenge to my mind is how do we help these young genius, little genius, to grow as naturalist. These children are learning the value of plant genetic resources and their importance for the health and safety of people and the planet. It's our responsibility to pass on to them all the knowledge and skills they will need to do their job wisely and well in the years to come. If we succeed, the next generation will not be confronted by that spectre of the last plant standing. The meek will inherit the earth. Goswami Mahavir Bharti. Trijo number to Patel Matsanga.